Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're gonna talk about V2 mini Starlink satellites. So let's dive right into it. So what exactly is the problem? The problem is the user base of Starlink is growing exponentially, meaning they were kind of expecting 100K users and now they have like 600K kind of users. So it grew exponentially. Consequence of that, while the user count is growing exponentially, the satellite launch is not growing that much. As in like, is it growing? Absolutely. Is it growing exponentially? Hell no, they are still not at 10,000. So current network flat out cannot keep up. On top of that, Elon Musk created a deal with T-Mobile. Now, T-Mobile wants to uh, create a scenario where basic smartphone, as in 5G smartphone, becomes like a 5G satellite phone. Can it be done? Yes. Many companies are doing it right now. Uh, and that's what T-Mobile want to do. But to do that, they have to create V2 satellite system. The satellite that they have right now on orbit is not that good. So they need something exponentially better per satellite wise. That's why they created V2. Now that means they have to launch V2. Unfortunately, V2 cannot be launched by normal rockets. They require this big puppy. And this puppy is not ready. So that creates an issue. And then they realize the fact that generally ion thrusters are not used for like, you know, basic satellites. They are generally used for long range systems and few and far between basically. But if you want to put something in low earth orbit and you want to make sure it's very low to the ground, as in like as close to 500 kilometers or sometimes even closer, uh, it's not going to last there forever or not even like few years. So what do you do? You put thruster there. That gives you the advantage that you can keep it in orbit as long as possible. And then once you run out of fuel, it automatically deorbits. So it also cleans the environment. So both of them are awesome, but you have to understand when you are, once you are launching one or two mission, cost of gas is not that expensive. But when you are planning to launch 40,000 satellite, at that point in time, even if you have to put few grams of gas in each satellite, the cost pile up. Xenon is expensive like idiotically expensive so they were using krypton but at the scale that they are using and the power levels they want to achieve even krypton is becoming expensive so that's the issue and the idea is v2 would be like all the lessons they have learned from making mark one product they will be like okay all the lessons we have learned collect it make a better v2 but again consequence of v2 is like this is okay good technology mark one technology 2g network they want to launch 3g network problem is this puppy is not ready this is way far behind and there is a clause in the contract that if they have but again uh, t-mobile is not stupid they kind of knows that elon musk has a like you know free running mouth so if he says in two years it may translate to like you know four years or eight years so for that reason there was a clause in the contract as in like speculating that you have to use falcon heavy or do something you have to launch something you cannot just like, oh, we are waiting. You have to launch something. And that's, there is the claw using V2 Mini. So that's the problem. They are reaching a point where things are just not working as smoothly as they wanted to. So V2 Mini is created. Now these puppies are heavy. How heavy? Uh, 800 kg, meaning these babies are 3x more heavy than the V1.5 that they were launching. So very, very heavy. And they can only put 21 satellites. That's why I specified this. Things are big and heavy. And again, this is the mini version. Imagine the full size version. Full size, they will not even be able to complete one orbital plane. So they fundamentally need Starlink, uh, Starship, otherwise it will not work. So 21 satellite compared to 60. So they may be able to squeeze a little bit here and there, but do not expect that number to go like to 60. That's not gonna happen because it's very heavy. And what about the throughput? Like the actual reason why they are launching it? That throughput is 4x greater, meaning each satellite can handle job of four. That means even if uh, they launch only 4,000, they will have much higher throughput. So they really, really want to do that. And it does have enough horsepower to actually contact 5G cell phones directly. Can older one do that? Yes, but it will be so useless, so noisy signal that you will be barely getting few bits per minute. So that's why they have to, like this has like some uh, specific algorithms, adjustment, uh, antenna configuration, all that jazz, basically that special sauce to make sure that this actually can communicate two way, be mindful, two way communication and not just like, okay, send SOS, not like that. It's like actual communication, WhatsApp, maybe even a very basic level, like, you know, WhatsApp voice notes sending from A to B, maybe. So that should be done. Now, it's in testing at this moment, meaning this puppy is in space. It has been launched, it's in space, it's uh, reaching to its final orbit, but it's not gonna be activated, quote unquote, unlocked for normal 5G customer just yet of T-Mobile. It's gonna take some time. This is just Mark 1 testing. Now, it's a mini trial for full scale of V2. All the V2 technology that they have learned from V1, they want to make, but here's the, the launch launcher is not ready. So what the hell they can do? They are creating this miniature version and testing as many technology as possible. If they're like, oh, we want to upgrade this, we're going to test it. We want to upgrade this, let's test it. So they are doing all of that. It's a bridge for, basically, it's it's a preparation stage for Starship. 
full scale V2. Now reflection becomes a very serious issue because you have to, these satellites are much brighter than anticipated. Uh, and when you are launching thousands of that, that creates an issue where it's not like ISS is idiotically bright, very, very, very bright, but it's one object. It's just one thing that you can easily track and you can calculate and you can put that into your uh, astronomical database and be like, hey, when the satellite try to observe something else or like block out the sensors in that area, that block out the sensor path, you're not going to get any clean data out of it. So that's one way of dealing with it. But if you're launching hundreds of it, and this is very early on photo, so they realize like at this point in time, it's getting crisscrossed. It's like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh very very and you are planning to launch 40,000 you only have around 4,000 it's already very 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 bad now here's the why the heck it is that bad we have thousands of satellite and god knows how many uh, space junk why the heck it's not an issue well generally it comes down to the angular size of this puppy now the object is not huge like it's big but not huge like there are other satellites that are bigger than this but most of them are generally much further away, either in medium earth orbit or uh, basically much further orbit or sometime in flat out geostationary, but you have to understand geostationary satellite is 36,000 kilometers away. That's very far away. Even if you make it like literally 10 times bigger than ISS, it will still look smaller to you. The angular resolution, angular diameter from your point of view would be tiny. And because these satellites are as close to ground as possible, as much as they want to make it possible, uh, it creates a consequence where even though they are not huge, the basically angular resolution from observatory point of view is huge. That's why they are creating a streak so big. And uh, so they tried, uh, they had V1, V1 had issue, they upgraded to V1.5, they uh, accepted a lot of feedback, they tried to do their best. Again, it was better compared to V1, but not that much better. We were like still not nowhere near as close as they wanted to. So V2 is built with all that feedback, whereas like if we are designing from day one, if we are no longer just like, okay, we're just going to try to retrofit. No, from day one, let's design in such a way that it does not have this issue. Uh, they did it with feedbacks. So what did it do? They added what we call dielectric mirror film, this puppy basically. And uh, these things are generally used whenever you want to reflect almost 100% of uh, any light. They can even work in wide band, meaning if you have solar light, you can reflect it. And if you are working with, let's say, ultra high power lasers uh, that are generally used in uh, ASML, you know, fabrication labs, they generally use this. These things are very efficient at reflection. They can reflect almost 100%. So it, the shiny part are reflected with that. So this reflects everything away rather than reflecting to the ground. So that's awesome. Then they have low reflectivity paint on everything. That's why it looks like matte black. So from day one, they have designed it in such a way that everything that we cannot make shiny, we're going to make awesome shiny. Things that we cannot make shiny, we're going to make it as matte as possible from day one. And orientation algorithms have been changed, meaning these panels are huge. How huge? 30 meter kind of huge. Like super duper huge kind of huge. So at that scale, it's going to show up. Specifically when it's going from night to day, basically that twilight zone is very brutal at that point in time. So they change the algorithm that during that time is going to make sure that the panels are not reflecting as much light as possible. Again, only for from satellites point of view, it's just few minutes. But doing that will make sure that observatory on ground can get much clearer sky. Again, these are just reflection mitigation that they are planning to use. At this point in time, it has been launched, uh, but it's going to take some time because again, right now it's very uh, shiny at this point in time because again, it has not reached final uh, altitude yet. Once it reaches that point, then we're going to know whether it worked or not. And be mindful, it's only in one orbit. So it's, they have to actually f send the data back. It's like, hey, your observatory, are you observing something? Uh, which satellite uh, shell is going there? Is that shell has this puppy or not? So. It's going to take some time before we actually have real world data. And be mindful, this is a worldwide issue, meaning it's not just like it's messing up with American observatory. It's messing up with Chinese observatory, Indian observatory, every Tom, Dick and Harry else observatory. So it's a very serious thing. That's why they are taking some serious precautions here. And this also helps them to make sure because V2 would be even more brutal. That puppy will be huge and it's going to have solar panels that may be the size of uh, basically almost ISS, I might want to say. Like they are planning to put some seriously large solar panels on that. And because of the low altitude, it's gonna block like this kind. We may be able to even see it with naked eye because again, stars, especially if you have very clean night, you'll see stars are there and then you'll randomly see one block moving away. Again, just as a negative shadow. So uh, they really need to sort this puppy out because you cannot just say, oh, hundreds of billions of dollars that you spent on ground observation, lull. It no longer works. So it's one of those things that they have to sort it. And that's why they are doing, this is a feedback study. They took all the feedback, they built it. And after the uh, after launch, they're gonna have real world feedback. And then they're gonna like, what do you want to do for V2? Or do they want to upgrade this? Or maybe this is good enough. We don't know, but they are really working on it. 
Then we come to the engines part. Now, ion thrusters are generally a known technology. It's a simple technology. It does work. It's awesome. But generally, they use xenons. Xenons are awesome for this application. However, they are expensive AF. Consequence of that, they are also low in supply. Meaning, even if you have GG amounts of money, where like blank check, you cannot just use as much as you want. We're gonna run out very quickly. So you switch to Krypton. Uh, Krypton is good, better, low cost, good, but still have that same issue. It's like it's cheap, but not that cheap. Now we come to basically that was used in Mark 1 project. Krypton was cheaper, but now they're moving to uh, Mark 2, which is gonna use Argon. Now why the heck Argon is so cheap? Well, you have to understand, it's in the atmosphere. And every country generally has a plant of what we call air distillation, meaning air in country that has oxygen supply, where the heck they're getting oxygen from? They're directly distilling air. They're taking air, liquefying it, meaning extracting liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, and voila, here's the fun fact, this argon there also. So every plant by default produces argon. Argon is no longer something like where it's like, oh, we have to do this process or we have to have this mine. No, 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 we got argon. Like, we got it, like it's a byproduct, we kind of get it. So it's very cheap. So using Argon, and now if you want to say, hey, I want to launch 40,000 satellites, Argon suppliers are like, uh, so two days of my supply? That's that's how much Argon we have. So that's what they are doing. Now, again, going from Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, it created a benefit that this puppy has thrust. Where the heck they have 2.4x amount of thrust? Now be mindful, it does sound huge, 2.4x of thrust, but we are talking about iron engine, meaning if you put it here, go iron man like this, nothing's gonna happen. You're just gonna get tired and you're like, <sighs> So do not expect like thrust kind of thrust. Th thrust as in like it's gonna fight uh, atmospheric drag much more efficiently and it does have a 1.5x better specific impulse, meaning the mileage is also longer. So a satellite that was let's say barely able to hold on for three years can easily hold on to five years. That's desirable. And again, the moment uh, engine runs out, poof, it's gonna crash on the earth, awesome. Now, how the heck they reached that point? Well, they reached, again, it does have a huge ass solar panel requirement. So they added solar panel. And SpaceX is one of those companies that do not just randomly acquire other companies, but they did acquire Swarm Technology Company, meaning this uh, CubeSat company. They were making CubeSats that are nanosats, meaning you can see all of this combined makes one CubeSat. And uh, they were launching this, and these had ion thrusters. They were very specific, like they had like truly high quality skill set when it comes to making ion engine. This company was acquired by SpaceX and they are developing the technology. So the jump from Krypton to Argon now paying dividend because they bought this company. This company provided the what we call skill set. The actual uh, patents and all that just came from this company. That's why they are able to upgrade their ecosystem. And this will be used in V2. So what about the, all of this ecosystem? Well, the core upgrade is happening in backhaul. So be mindful, they wanted to use laser from day one, laser, 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 but they have not used it. Likelihood of that is like lasers are expensive and they are huge also. Meaning even if you do not have a cost limitation, you do have a size limitation. Meaning you need this puppy in order to even dream about it. And because they don't have this puppy, they cannot dream about it. Of course, they can launch it. They can launch one or two, but again, they ideally they do want to launch multiple orbital shell in one go. Otherwise, it's just too ineffective. At least one orbital shell, like one orbital ring done in one shot, that's awesome. But if you do not want to do that, it's really useless. Even with a low cost of SpaceX, it's not going to work. So they need this. But what the hell are they going to do in meantime? Meantime, they are already reaching shortage. So they are upgrading the black hole to black hole, I'm saying back hole to E-band. E band is 60 gigahertz to 90 gigahertz. Now, if you're familiar with gigahertz, you know for a fact that the higher the frequency, the lower the range. How the heck is going to communicate so far? Like each satellite could be as far as 100 kilometers from another satellite. Thankfully, they are in vacuum of space and you can make really, really good phase shift array technology at higher frequency. So you can truly communicate very effectively. And the, that's the core upgrade here. Everything that has to do with phase shift technology is going through multiple generations of upgrade. So version one was technology number one, version 1.5, version number two. This puppy has third generation. So it's fundamentally much better than the last one. And it's a kind of common thing. It's like how your mobile phone was like 10 years ago versus how it is now. It happens like you do it brick by brick. And majority of 5G phones does have phase shift technology. So if all of this uh, test is successful, then again, congestion on network will start to go down because they will launch multiple orbital shells brick by brick, brick by brick. And then they're like, oh, either this will act as a backhaul or they maybe directly talk to customer. And then everybody was like, okay, finally we have 100 Mbps. So that's a really, really good. And again, that's the easiest way to test for uh, version two upgrades. And this will also allow mobile style ring. Starlink right now, uh, they want to sell it to basically aircraft. They can do it, but it's not as effective as they want it to. Is it better than every other system? Absolutely. But it is as awesome as it used to be? No. To solve that, basically to have like Starlinks working on a robot, uh, remote vehicles, uh, moving vehicles, they really need satellite that has more oomph. 
this puppy will have that. And satellite smartphone does require exponentially more oomph. So let's see what happens. So this, be mindful, this is just a trial at this point in time. So this was my presentation on Mark II mini, V2 mini satellites Starlink. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.